Okay, so the sublime. So what I want to do, to, I want to do the sublime today so we can get on to art next week, since we're running out of time a bit. Um, and I don't want to get lost too much in the details, especially in the mathematical sublime, which you can get lost in, uh, because I really do want to say a bit about the phenomenon itself of the sublime, which is so peculiar, and to try to uh, understand it from a, a variety of angles. Namely, that we have it, that we care about it, that we want it at all. What we are doing by scaring ourselves, all of this seems to me odd and interesting. Uh, we left off last time discussing uh, page 245, uh, where I had already talked about the phrase, for the one liking that for the beautiful carries with it directly a feeling of life's being furthered and hence is compatible with charms and with an imagination at play. But the other liking, the feeling of the sublime, is a pleasure that arises only indirectly. It is produced by a feeling of momentary inhibition of the vital forces, followed immediately by an outpouring of them that is all the stronger. So a pleasure in our <coughs> being afraid or anguished or disturbed, and a somehow overcoming of that disturbance, or a framing, or controlling, or indeed subliming of it, sublimating it. Uh, in some way. Uh, Kant will give a naively easy answer to the question of that pleasure, um, uh, but I will wonder, you should wonder, one wonders whether his sense of the pleasure in the sublime is as directly straightforward as all of that. That seems to me the real question. Um, Kant goes on to say, hence it is an emotion I, I hesitate only because feelings and emotions are different things and comes collapsing in here, but he seems aware that something else is going on, that pleasures are usually taken to be immediate feelings. Emotions, just to be clear, are usually taken to be intentional. That is, they have an object, they have a structure, they can uh, be appropriate or inappropriate. So calling it an emotion um, is already acknowledging the weight of reflection involved in this feeling, uh, that it may be closer indeed to an emotion than an outright feeling in the way that the harmony of the faculties could legitimately thought of to be just a feeling. Right? Um, one gets why that might be a pleasurable feeling. Something about the pleasure here, therefore, is, is problematic. Um, and he says, hence it is emotion, and so it seems to be seriousness rather than play. That suddenly we're no longer at play in nature, but a seriousness in the imagination's activity. Hence, too, this liking is incompatible with charms, and since the mind is not just attracted by the object, but is alternately also repelled as well, the liking for the sublime can, contains not so much a positive pleasure as rather admiration and respect, and so should be called a negative pleasure. How do you like that for an oxymoron? A negative pleasure. What's a negative pleasure when he's at home? And why, and with what license, does he automatically think he can get admiration and respect in here? 
right? All this needs a little unpacking to be sure. Um, Leotard looks at this moment um, in a slightly peculiar way uh, since when he looks at the notion of the seriousness rather than the play, uh, he thinks of... He wants... Leotard wants to get from the beautiful to the sublime, and therefore his first gesture, which does not follow Comte, is to imagine the imagination itself proliferating its forms, or, as he puts it, going wild, as it does in art, that is, in the work of genius. Genius is the proliferation of forms. Um, So he says that this overabundance of images, this proliferation of forms, by the imagination gone wild, makes up for this powerlessness of principle, powerlessness to create a whole. But then creativity is no longer in free play, pleasant, even fortuitous. It falls prey to a regime of anguish. Why anguish? On his interpretation, he says, this must be understood Uh, in the seriousness with which Kant qualifies the activity of the imagination of the sublime, it is the seriousness, he says, of melancholy. Why melancholy? Well, because imagination here is suffering from an irreparable lack. An impotence in inadequacy. And what it's suffering, what it's missing, is an absolute nostalgia for forms only, always being form, that is, limitation. So it's the experience of the relationship between the limited and the unlimited, So even as it deploys an unlimited field of proliferating forms before thought, the imagination remains a slave to its finitude because each of the forms it invents and adds to the others remains limited by definition. That is, in the experience of the sublime, we are in the area of seriousness because we are in the area of acknowledging our finitude because the imagination is always brought up to the fact that it can only have finite forms, so no matter how many it has, it's stuck with that finitude and has to acknowledge it. And acknowledge that finitude is in some way inadequate. So finitude here is a privation and remains privative throughout the discourse of the sublime. Ruby? Okay, so could you look at this from a dialectical point of view? That wasn't dialectical <coughs> enough? No, I mean because like the, because of like the negative emotion. You know how like you know in the like to, like it's not it's like the negation of the other. You know you know what I'm talking about? And it's like and it's like before I'm like kind of referring this to Hegel, like kind of kind of like that. Like can you answer that? Can you say I will later ask the question about the scene of the sublime, which I will come back to the Hegelian moment. I think there's a suppressed, I do think there's a kind of suppressed Hegelian thing going on here. Uh, But we need to work up to it. Okay? Yeah. I'm just wondering, so we have the stress on finitude and the melancholy, but Kant wanted to say that precisely what's revealed to us is our own infinitude. 
Yes. That were subject to the, were sure. the origin of the moral law. Or oh, absolutely. But but after all, the question is the question that Leotal was raising is why, even though this is the, an aesthetic thing, why has Kant dropped the notion of play and insist on seriousness? That up to now, it's all been play and harmony and the free play of the imagination and getting in tune with nature, and now we're going to get serious. <laughs> and he, he wants to ask, well, what, what's, what, why is Kant using that language here? And the suggestion then is he's going to use that language because something about finitude is going to prove insufficient. So something about finitude, when he says melancholic, he means... Finitude is here experienced as absolute loss. That we cannot, as it were, uh, so we may find an infinity to balance it out, but the finitude itself, if we're going to take the notion of anguish or pain seriously, has to be roughly at that level. I think that's the suggestion. So it's, it's getting what? It's getting the right weight into the notion of the moment of pain in the sublime. So, so, so we, it's, the problem of pleasure is going to be hard by itself, but the first issue is it can't be, let me put it another way, Kant is emphatic that as an aesthetic phenomenon, this has a structure of pain and pleasure. And therefore, whatever the moment of, of the negative is here, negative feelings, those negative feelings have to be more than, oh, I can't do it. Right? There are many things I can't do and I kind of feel bad about it, but I wouldn't even call it pain. And, and that's why, even in the case of the mathematical sublime, you may think, pain? So, so as much as anything, we want to at least get some motivation for the language of pain, seriousness, anguish, uh, and the like that that Kant uses. Um, being repelled, feeling of repulsion. Strong language. So that, that's why. And, and therefore, something about our finitude here comes under some severe pressure. I think that's the so it's, it's just the negative side there. But if you go down the other side, well, at least according to Hegel, it would be universal. You know, and the fact it's that... It's going to be universal for Kant, too. Yeah, so so like, so like if, if that's the finitude, it's like we have to replace it with, I don't know how Kant does it, but we replace it with the universal, which would in turn probably be a positive determination? It is for Kant, yeah. Cool. So... So the notion of negative pleasure, and I, I just want to, why do I think that's important? Because one of the questions you should be asking yourself, I'll come back to later when he has, was a section 27 where he has the phenomenology of the feeling, um, is whether the feeling of the sublime is one complex emotion or a alternating or causal series of emotions of pain followed by a pleasure. At least here, and this is why I want to underline it, in calling it a negative pleasure, he seems to be thinking of the sublime as one complex feeling rather than a alternation, as, I, as I'll use the language later, or a series of different feelings. Um, 
and which is appropriate and why is again worth asking. Okay. Now, of course, the, the big disanalogy, which we were looking at analogies and disanalogies between beauty and the sublime, and the massive one that he mentions at 245 is that while beauty is purposive, purposive for the power of judgment, the sublime is contra purposive for the power of judgment. as he puts it, um, contra-purpose of our power of judgment, incommensurate with our power of exhibition, and as it were, violent to our imagination, and yet we judge it all the more sublime for that. So the more contra-purpose, the more violent, the more humiliation we suffer, get your masochistic whips out, the happier we are. Okay, so we get that reversal going. Now, all that said, as I mentioned last time, Kant then withdraws, at least in this way, by saying that there is nothing sublime in nature. That, properly speaking, the sublime belongs not to nature, but to the mind. So, page 245 still, instead, all we are entitled to say is that the object is suitable for exhibiting a sublimity that can be found in the mind. For what is sublime in the proper meaning of the term cannot be contained in any sensible form, but concerns only ideas of reason, which, though they cannot be exhibited adequately, are aroused and called to mind by this very inadequacy, which can be exhibited in sensibility. So it's the experience of the imagination which is the stand-in for sensibility as a whole, suffering some humiliation, some violence, as it attempts to grasp uh, some natural scene, and in its failure to do so, there is put in mind, we'll see the putting in mind actually happens earlier, but finally we recognize that even though we cannot think of an object as infinite, we come to recognize an infinity in us. That is, ideas of reason here, ideas of the unconditioned, or, if you wish, ideas of the absolute, which themselves, qua ideas, can never be exhibited. So he says, I mean, it's there's a kind of crazy ludicrousness to it, right? It's hard not to break into comedy here. And the comedy happens in a passage like this. The vast, thus the vast ocean heaved up by storms cannot be called sublime. The sight of it is horrible. <coughs> uh, Kant, of course, never saw a vast ocean. <laughs> like, <laughs> like many things... Kant didn't see very much, except the streets of Kant. Um, anyway, the sight of it is horrible, and one must already have filled one's minds with all sorts of ideas. If such an intuition is to attune it to a feeling that is itself sublime, inasmuch as the mind is induced to abandon sensibility and occupy itself with ideas containing a higher purpose of this. So there you are, looking at the roaring ocean, heaving up, feeling horrified, and now you are to turn away from this somehow, as you're looking at it, and occupy yourself with the ideas of reason. 
can never quite figure out how the mind does that. But okay. Well, the point I think I'd like to underline at this juncture, or one of the things I want to discuss, is it is evident here that we are getting an opposing conception of the natural world to the one we got when we looked at the problem of the beautiful. In the question of the beautiful, we examine the natural world as an appropriate habitat for human beings, something we were attuned to, something we had our natural place in and were part of and continuous with. The view of nature in the sublime is just the opposite. Um, nature in the instance of the sublime is primordial nature. It is that nature which is threatening to human beings. It is that nature which primitive human beings were terrified of, which they gave godlike names to. Um, and the structure of the sublime in Kant is really, at least in part, a part of this primitive battle between um, the human being and uh, the natural world. Someone who understood this perfectly and who provided uh, a kind of caricature of the Kantian view of the sublime is, is Schiller in his uh, great essay on the sublime. So what is done, as it were, behind the scenes in Kant is done wide open and crudely by Schiller. So let me spend a few minutes on Schiller, just so you, because I think this is the story, at least one of the stories that's going on in Kant. Schiller views human beings as surrounded, he says, by numberless forces, which are superior to him and hold sway over him. And we undertake all sorts of efforts to control threatening nature. And indeed, our intelligence, say our understanding, is actually the instrument by which we attempt to control and manipulate nature, to dominate nature, in order to bring it into harmony with our natural needs. And to a certain extent, Schiller says, we succeed uh, in reigning physically over everything that is physical. Let's call that technology. But still, Schiller says, man's efforts inevitably founder. And they founder, he says, because we can never overcome death. Death is the single point where a human being is under constraint and bound. Now, it is at this single point, says Schiller, that the human being boasts his liberty, his freedom. So, for Schiller, the human being properly understood is irrecon irreconcilable with succumbing to any exterior force. The sensible. He must, Schiller says, be man in the full sense of the term, and consequently he must have nothing to endure contrary to his will. Accordingly, when he no longer can oppose to physical forces any proportional physical force, only one resource remains to him to avoid suffering any violence. He must, 
Schiller says, annihilate as an idea the violence he is obliged to suffer in fact. It's a great phrase. He is obliged to annihilate as idea the violence he is obliged to suffer in fact. Now what he means by that is that we are capable of doing so because we are moral beings. And as moral beings, we participate in a higher order than the natural order. And indeed, like following Kant absolutely, Schiller thinks of this higher order as the moral law itself. That is the law of freedom. (coughs) So Schiller says, man is in the hands of nature, but the will of man, his power of freedom, is in his own hands. So, the sublime for Schiller is a sensuous means to teach us that we have something more in us than a sensuous nature. So I'm quoting Schiller now. He says, Here the physical man and the moral man separate in the most marked manner. For it is exactly in the presence of objects that make us feel at once how limited the former is, that is, the physical man, that the other, the moral man, makes the experience of its force. The very thing that lowers one to the earth is precisely that which raises the other to the infinite. One last, slightly longer passage from Schiller. Schiller thinks that, so, one of the reasons that Schiller's interested in the sublime, and the question is, why are we interested in the sublime, is because he thinks that ordinarily we tend to forget our moral vocation. We forget our superiority to nature in having this purely rational power within us, and that part of what makes us forget this is indeed the beautiful. The beautiful is a kind of seduction that leads us to think that nature might be friendly, that the world may be okay, that we can get on with life in a sensible way, and that in feeling the beautiful, we think of ourselves as in mutually dependent relationships on nature, and are satisfied by that. This is illusory, for Schiller. He says it is not little by little, for between absolute dependence and absolute liberty, there is no possible transition. It is suddenly and by a shock that the sublime wrenches our spiritual and independent nature away from the net which feeling has spun around us, and which enchains the soul more tightly because of its subtle texture. 
later he says um, one single sublime emotion often suffices to break all this tissue of imposture the imposture is beautiful spirituality at one blow to give freedom to the fettered elasticity of spiritual nature to reveal its true destination and to oblige it to conceive for one instant at least the feeling of its liberty so the thought here is of an absolute incommensurability between our moral powers and our habitation of the natural world. No transitions are possible. And the sublime is going to be a moment in which we come face to face with our physical standing in the world and are wrenched out of it in order to feel an absolute liberty. Remember, this is being written at about the time that's going to be the French Revolution. Right? So absolute liberty, absolute terror, absolute freedom, all of these are kicking around in this notion of this lack of mediation between nature and freedom. Yeah. So then this is like a total contradiction that he seems to fail to reconcile. You know, do you know why call the contradiction? Well, the thing he's, is, he's defending this. No, no, no. I mean, okay. So, like, you're the person, right? And there's nature, right? So you stand opposed to it, right? And you're saying that's like it's incommensurable, which means that okay, well, what are we supposed to do with the two sides of the equation? You know, we can't, we can't like line them up and have them meet. So it just seems like he can't reconcile that incommensurability. He's arguing for that incommensurability. That's supposed to be the point. It's not, this is not felt by Kant as a contradiction. This is felt by Kant as a revelation. Not for Hegel, though, because Hegel says... Well, yeah, Hegel's a different philosopher. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, Hegel says that Kant is just left with abstract identity because he doesn't resolve the contradiction. So, so let's I, ask, no, let's ask the question. Why insist upon this? The insistent comes in exactly the same way as it came in Pascal. Right? I may be an infinite speck in a physical universe, but I am an infinite speck that is capable right, of comprehending that whole and therefore in every sense beyond it. So this is that moment when um, rationality is trying to come to grips with the meaning of a joint discovery. And I think it's important to think of this moment as terribly fraught in the history of ideas, one which I would argue we haven't thought through yet, namely that we live in a disenchanted physical universe one hand, and we have discovered our powers for historical creation on the other. That we are free self-determining agents. And for Kant, and I think that this is part of why he thinks the story of the sublime is important, the sublime is that moment in which those two Things are experienced, not just thought, but experienced, right? So part of the depth of the sublime is that it brings us to that pitch of, not contradiction, but I will say, I'll agree with you, aporia in the modern situation of the modern subject. That's how Kant would think it. Right? And the sublime for him is that lesson of that experience of that aporia. Yeah? I have a textual question. Mm -hmm. um, we know you want to separate the moralization of the beautiful, right? That third layer that Kant adds on. Clearly, Kant didn't add this on later because the supply was 
one of his earliest concerns, but had he moral did he moralize? But it was not line? it was not an original part of the project for the book. It wasn't. Okay. No. So is that then part of this third wave moralization? Yes. So in other words, this is a domestic so it's in the air, Burke's talking about he said, I gotta domesticate this stuff. This stuff's just crazy. Absolutely. But, it, and, and of course, I won't go through the story now. Uh, he domesticated it in a totally different way in the early book on, he wrote a book called Observations, I've never discussed this, but he wrote an earlier book in the 60s, 60-something, uh, called Observations on the Beautiful and the Sublime. And when he discusses the sublime, it's this horrendously sexist passage where, where, where roughly guys are sublime and women are beautiful. And in, you know the story, right? So, so there's this whole gender language and it deals with education. Uh, so he tries to domesticate it that way there, but he hadn't really hit on his full theory there. So he was, but he was there, even then trying to make it all work out all right. Um, here... Um, so we, was this added at the same time as that third stratum? Yes. Okay. Right. So this, this, uh, so the whole of the sublime is part of that extra moral layer, and they went together. What exactly is domesticated? What? The sublime. Ah, that's right. So, so, as I say, he's trying to contain. I mean, after all, I mean, Burke is merely psychological, but. Um, so it's hard, I mean, it's hard to know what to do with the Burkean analysis. But for Burke, it's nature that's sublime, right? not, 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 not reason within us. Um, and, and it's natural for us to think, we do think still, despite Kant, that it's, you know, the Alps that are sublime, or, or the starry heavens that are sublime. Kant thinks that is subreption. Right? That is, he thinks we are projecting onto the object an infinity that is only proper to the subject. <coughs> and that's his way of trying to contain it. Now, the part of the reason he does so, uh, even though I think it is a containment strategy is because having thought about Burke's psychology he can't figure out where the pleasure is going to come from. Uh, so he at least in a way that Burke doesn't really sufficiently I think account for is at least giving a go at answering the question why we feel pleasure in this. So, in that sense, the, the details of the account do matter because his phenomenology of the experience is trying to at least get to grips with the way in which this involves both negative and positive emotions or feelings. Okay. okay let's, let's talk about the mathematical sublime and then we'll have a break. Again, uh, you can get really lost in the mathematical sublime, uh, but I will try to keep it to its bold core arguments as far as possible. So in paragraph 25, um, he defines the sublime as... Absolutely large, the mathematical sublime. And what is absolutely large is what is large beyond all comparison. The beyond all comparison is the crux here. Because if it's not a comparative largeness, it means it's not measured against anything else. It means that it is without limit. If it had a limit, we could compare it again. Therefore, it is uh, what is absolute or unconditioned. It is um, to be measured only against itself. 
and yet being without limits. Um, unfortunately, um, Luhar begins his account, his translation of pages 248-9, getting the distinction between the absolutely great and the simply great, and then loses it. So the translation is a bit confusing. Uh, Allison gives all the details on page 312. But rough and readily, what's going on on pages 248-9 is a discussion not of the absolutely great, but of originally the simply great. And he's using the notion of the simply great as a prologue to the absolutely great. So let me talk about the simply great. Um, How about the Empire State Building? That's simply great. Um, That's big. Okay, that's that's kind of junk. Whoa, that's awesome. Now, in making the judgment, that's awesome. It appears as non-comparative. Um, but only because we're not using any explicit measure. But a measure is assumed nonetheless, albeit an indeterminate one, because... <coughs> we do expect others to agree with our judgment. That is, we don't think, we don't think it's a merely relative judgment. We think being in a certain position, looking up, that's awesome, that's got to be right. Now, in measuring it, We are therefore, according to Kant, making an aesthetic judgment. So the Empire State Building for Kant would be, if I say put it, sort of sublime. Well, this way of leading into the topic of the mathematically sublime is confusing. It's confusing because roughly an indeterminate concept is not the same as no concept. And Kant seems to assume an indeterminate concept is like having no concept, which tells you a lot about Kant. Um, And therefore, he, although he thinks we are judging by the eye, we are in fact assuming a rough measure or an inexact measure, but nonetheless a measure. It's just that that measure is unmentioned. What's the measure we're using? Yeah. Us, our own physical body. Our own body. The suppressed measure is the measure of the body. Uh, and indeed, the measure of the body will be something that is running throughout all of this. That is when we look at things in terms of size, big, small, there's always got to be a relativity to the body and the powers, of course, of the body and the powers of the mind. Kant then goes on to uh, suggest, uh, as a brief interlude, that we think of the large as that which is deserving of respect and admiration, and the small is what is deserving of contempt, uh, which is to say he thinks that there is a quantitative affective geometry. Um, And Levinas also seems to think this, doesn't he? things that you are called from on high. Why from on high? Why can't you be called by something, a small voice? That's another tradition. Why can't you feel ultimate admiration 
a small speck. But there is a kind of, um, kind of <coughs> naive effective geometry running through this. I remind you of that because I think it is both naive and cultural and specific and tainted and not natural. Um, okay. At 2.50, uh, he finally does get to the absolutely great. Which... Um, He says, but suppose we call something not only large, but abs- large absolutely. Schlechten absolute. In every respect, beyond all comparison, that is sublime. Clearly, in that case, we do not permit a standard adequate to it to be sought outside it, but only within it. It is a magnitude that is equal only to itself. So the notion of absolutely large is a magnitude equal only to itself. It follows it follows this. Terribly important that how definitions slip into big inferences here. It follows that the sublime must not be sought in things of nature but must be sought solely in our ideas. But in which of these it resides is a question that must wait for the deduction. The above explication can also be put as follows. Let let me just stop. His his thought here is that if you choose any physical object as a measure, no matter how large, light years, whatever, um, they're nonetheless going to be comparative. Therefore, anything you can find in the natural world is going to fail of the definition of being absolutely large and hence necessarily the argument is going to run what is absolutely large has the measure only in itself (coughs) cannot be anything physical that is sublime he then goes on just to rub it in in comparison with which everything else is small he then takes the next step. We can easily here see that nothing in nature can be given, however large we may judge it, that could not, when considered in a different relation, be degraded all the way to the infinitely small. Now, the way in which this works, the reason why this is required, the way he thinks the argument operates, Um, (coughs) is that there's a relationship in this business of figuring out the right measurement between the imagination and reason. So that Here's the object. The object is going to bring the imagination to counting. And it can count. can just keep on counting. What it cannot 
provide totality. So that anything the imagination does, no matter how far, so that imagination is, is going to be in time and keep going. The reason says that, act, that activity of counting, we want to always totalize it into an absolute whole. So reason is telling the imagination, totalize your infinity. Bring it into what? A single intuition. So reason is commanding the imagination to do this kind of work. And it will be the imagination's failure to do so. It cannot do that. So it will fail, not from, not absolutely. Notice the imagination, if the imagination were left on its own, it's done. It would just keep counting. One billion and one, one billion and two. You know, one billion light years, two billion, it just keeps going. It's stupid. The imagination on its own will not fail. It only fails from the requirement of totalization. So it's the requirement of totalization that yields the failure of the imagination. And it's the failure of the imagination that then will give on to reason as not sensible, but super sensible, And reason as super sensible is that in accordance, in comparison with which all else is small. That's the logic, and that's what he says in the following three sentences. Uh, So he says, what happens is that our imagination strives to progress towards infinity. That's that's that line. While our reason demands the absolute, demands totality. As the real idea. And so the imagination, our power of estimating the magnitude of things in the world of sense is inadequate to that idea. So it fails to take its counting into a single intuition, one single whole. There's also a problem of, as he mentions when he gets down to the details of this, there's a problem of taking what is temporal here and turning it into a simultaneity. So it's as if reason has to wants to transcend time itself because the mind itself is a temporal activity. So the violence, so reason itself is doing a violence, he says, to inner sense. Yet this inadequacy itself, itself, this inadequacy is the arousal in us of the feeling that we have within us a supersensible power. And what is absolutely large is not an object of sense, but is the use that judgment makes naturally of certain objects so as to arouse this feeling, and in contrast with that, any other use is small. So, so in a way, reason is using the supersensible to arouse the feeling of the smallness of the physical universe. So the sublime is what even to be able to think proves that the mind has a power surpassing any standard of sense.
Now, in paragraph 26, he tries to take this logic and he tries to tie it down in a more complicated way. And he's going to call this this moment apprehension. And this moment comprehension. And then he's going to uh, say apprehension is the collecting up to infinity. Comprehension is the holding together of what is collected. When comprehension fails, and he says the comprehension fails when, say, you're looking at the stars, and you're doing an end, and you're getting to, you know, 3,787, and and you start losing the first stars. (laughs) So every time you count a new star, another one from the beginning drops out. You can't hold them all together. That's the image he has in mind. When the comprehension fails by the beginning dropping out, the notion of of a maximum is then recognized and the imagination is exceeded. Um, So, he says, page, I just simplified a really complicated bit of argument. He says on page 254, the paragraph that begins, that the mind listens to the voice of reason within itself. Hence, reason demands comprehension in one intuition and exhibition of all the members of a progressively increasing numerical series, and it exempts them from this demand, not even, and it exempts from this demand not even the infinite space and past time. Rather, reason makes us unavoidably think of the infinite in common reason's judgment as given in its entirety, in its totality. So this is an argument that, for those of you who know it, is not unlike the antinomies of space and time in the first critique, where in terms of the phenomenal world, we keep on counting, but in terms, uh, numinally, we can think of space or time as an absolute whole. 